Hello and welcome back to Space Tourism. Bit more of an exciting episode today. This is episode 12, I believe. And today we're going to be sending a base to Leith. Yes. Previous two episodes we've just been putting things into orbit or doing little jobs like that. No, today, today we've got something exciting. We're going to be building these little home basey kind of things, connecting them together on Leith. And uh, yeah, we're going to be sending them there today, and that's going to be really cool. No, why will it make it? Why will it be cool? You may be wondering. Because Leith is actually currently, despite the fact it's got liquid water oceans, it is actually one degree C. You know, it's very, it's just, just over the limits where uh, water will melt, ice will melt. So yes, yeah, so we're building this today. We have got uh, this little prototype here, this little base prototype. And I started off thinking, okay, I just want to have some way of housing Kerbals first. And that's the first thing I want to send. I want to land. This is on land as well. We might be making, we might be making a water base at some point. Lathe kind of begs it. But uh, this is going to be on land, probably near the coast. So, I want to have some sort of base system. Some modular kind of unit to be put together and connected to other ones. So, flat panels with habitation modules and uh, docking ports to connect it to other versions. Now, I'm also adding wheels now. And getting rid of the big, uh, the big side-mounted rockets we have there, because as you could see from the thrust back then, they had many, uh, they had plenty of thrust, absolutely plenty. Didn't need to carry or lug those massive things around. So, adding wheels so that we can drive across the surface, which is quite important, because where we land is most likely not going to be where we end up wanting to put our base. And also, these rockets are probably a better alternative to using the big ones. Oh, and we blow up a docking port on the edge. Well, we better blow up the other one just to even it out. There we go. So, something else about the design. Uh, we do have VTOLs. We have VTOL to slow down in the case of parachutes being insufficient to uh, to slow us down so that we can land without damaging anything in lay this thin atmosphere. It is very thin. It does have a very, very thin atmosphere. I mean, it only extends up to something like 40 kilometers, but the atmospheric pressure at sea level is not nearly as much as it is on Kerbin. So, yes, that will help. And, um, uh, yeah, we're, we're gonna just get rid of this thing now. <laughs> hey, we have to test it in every single way, and that includes falling off of VABs. So, we also have panels, as you can see. We've got struts leading out to the docking ports, but we've got panels around the rim. Why is this? Well, I want Kerbals to be able to walk around and go from base to base, and I want this to all be connected quite well for the Kerbals, because it's got to be, it's got to be comfortable, it's got to be, it's got to be classy and comfortable. I don't know how classy this stuff is, but you know, they're Kerbals, they probably have different ideas about leisure than we do. Um, so yes, they have got panels, which hopefully, I'm hoping Kerbals will successfully be able to walk on. Anyway, transport. What are we doing for transport? Gonna stack them all with these uh, double-sided separating decouplers, which will eject from both the top and the bottom one and, and remain by itself. We're gonna stick it on top of our SLS-2, which we always use, which is amazing, and we're gonna stick some nuclear engines on top. Now this was a last minute addition, because I wasn't going to have nuclear engines, I was just going to hope that the SLS-2 would have sufficient thrust to move this all. The The weight of four of my home units is something in the region of 40 tonnes. So, you know, that it's possible, it's certainly possible that the SLS by itself will be able to do this. Unfortunately, a calamity does occur, and we shall be seeing this momentarily. So we're going to launch, I'm not going to waste time showing too much of the, the launching and then the rendezvous, I mean the, the, the interplanetary transfer and all that. We just, we launched, yeah, now we're in orbit. Well now we're suborbital but we're circularizing and now we're in orbit. And then we are ready to burn for interplanetary space after, excuse me, after time warping to get the correct launch window. So, we burn, we burn, we burn prograde. Now look at the SLS-2, look at it, look at it. Oh, what's that? Bang! Now I cut the thrust because I noticed it go wrong. I've had this happen before. For some reason, the thrust is sufficient to condense matter. Look at it slow motion. See that, see that? Yeah, they just slide through. If I hadn't cut the thrust there, then our launch stage would have ended up going straight the way into our home modules and then exploding in the center like a really awesome frag grenade. Luckily I did cut the thrust 
and that didn't happen, and also luckily we do have these nuclear engines. Oh yeah, and there was just this probe core. We were spinning madly, so I stopped the time warp to cancel out the rotation, and then out flies this probe core, which must have belonged to the SLS-2. So that's not good, the fact that that's happened. I guess, I don't know what the reason for it is, but as I said, I've, I have encountered this bug before. And it could have killed us right there and then. Because, because in this series I try to quick load and quick save as little as possible. Anyway, so I would have had to relaunch everything. Anyway, so yes, we do the burn using our nuclear engines, which takes ages. It takes a really, really long time. We don't need the station today, we're not going to be using this, we're just going to be going straight, straight for lathe, no docking for the station. And in fact, going straight for lathe, I might take that a bit more literally than it sounds. Going straight for lathe, well that kind of implies, okay, we're going to first error break around Jewel and then go on to, no, no, I think we might just go straight for lathe. Oh, so we're going to error break in Jewel orbit, and then we'll get captured into a Jewel orbit. Into a uh, into a lathe orbit. No, no, I don't think so. No, I think we'll go straight for lathe, <clears throat> and maybe, maybe just maybe, maybe this will sound crazy, but you know, it sounds crazy to those people who do silly stuff like real life rocket science. Maybe we'll go from interplanetary speeds straight down towards lathe, as in straight down towards lathe, as in straight down towards lathe. Now, you may think this is crazy, but I assure you, it has potential to work. At least we get very accurate landing. We can choose exactly where we're going to go. We're just going to land ourselves just on the rim, or hopefully right in the center of this rim, this donut kind of shaped crater, uh, that we're going to... It's, it's just above where we've landed Jebediah Kerman in his lathe-bound plane. You can see it just there, that ship down on the, on the ground. The island just there. And the reason I'm going into the sea now is because the rotation of lathe, despite the fact that it's only going to be a few minutes till we impact, I mean land, land, not impact, land. Despite the fact it's only going to be a few minutes, the lathe will rotate somewhat. Anyway, let's go. Screaming down towards the planet, interplanetary speed, 6,000 kilometers, uh, 6,000 meters per second. And we're flying down, this is real time speed now. Burning up in the atmosphere, look at those flames, so bright, we're gonna detach them all, open up the parachutes, ooh, okay, nothing's broken yet, nothing's broken yet, but, but three of them are uncomfortably close together, will they break, will the parachutes open just in the right way to make sure that nothing explodes, oh, this is gonna be nice, and, three, two, one, open, ooh, nothing exploded, excellent, okay. So, where are we now? <laughs> the fact that this works, if I had mods such as FAR installed, which is a realistic aerodynamic model, or a more realistic aerodynamic model, if I had that installed, we would have been dead! But no, no, we were actually absolutely fine. <laughs> so everything's kind of bunched up together. This one that I'm currently looking at is on its own, and I'm just going to burn upwards to get it away from them as possible. Uh, but then that leaves the problem with the other three. These three together, all mangled, all on top of each other, interwined, intertwined, into other words. Trying to burn, just try and separate them out a little bit, but they land. Oh, get a few explosions, and then the other one lands just behind it, and it seems to be fine. Although it bursts its back wheel. And these things won't be able to drive. Majority of them do have burst wheels. We're going to have to do something about that. Anyway. But they've all seemed to have landed safely. The only thing that exploded was a few docking ports. And we don't need all of the docking ports. We do have some spares. So, flat tyres, better call out Repairman Jeb. Yeah, that's what he's been reduced to. Before he was a Kerbonaut, he worked in a garage. Uh, s fixing tyres. So that's why Kerbals can just... Or Jeb specifically can just snap their fingers and fix those tires without even touching them. They can just stand vaguely near them in some predefined area and actually be capable of fixing tires. It's incredible. It's way more incredible than the fact that they can, you know, have a space agency, an entire space industry, without actually having any infrastructure or cities or population. But we mustn't question these things. We mustn't question these things because then paradoxes occur. For some reason. So, this plane. This plane we have here on lathe, the lathe-bound Mark II, uh, is on its way. It was very close, only a matter of 30-40 kilometers away on the opposing island. 
Now, unfortunately, we did land just on the rim of the island over there. The home base has not got any people in, there's just probes, but they landed right on the very edge of the coast, which is kind of half... It, it's one of those pessimistic, optimistic balance things. Is the glass half full or is it half empty? Because... Oh no, we're right near the sea, there's nowhere to land a plane, we're on a slope, oh my god, all the weirs are burst, the docking ports, oh it's terrible. At least we're not in the sea. Thinking about how close did we come, it's miraculous really that we didn't land in the sea, look how close that was. We had no cross-range authority, we were just begging, just hoping that we would land on land, and we managed to, so that is fairly lucky. Uh, anyway, we're doing a recon, just flying by. Don't have much fuel left in these tanks. We do have more in the center tank, but I can't really transfer that mid-flight without getting some instabilities. So we're gonna have to use what's remaining in these tanks. Make good use of it, because now we need to land. And uh, thinking about it now, I could have landed quite close. I could have landed probably down on that rim, actually, and it really would have been fine. Instead, I'm going to land here. Which, from the air, seems close enough, but then when you think about it, I'm actually going to be walking. I've not got any rovers, I'm not certainly not going to be taxiing this plane down that slope, no, no, no. 3.8 kilometers. 3.8 kilometers. 3.7 now, okay, that's fine then. 3.7 kilometers. Looks like I am going to be taxiing, but no, no, I'm actually just going to break it, just going to break, close landing gear so we don't go anywhere, and I can actually get back in later on if I so desire. And yeah. Oh, there's a probe on that body, isn't there? There's a probe. Huh. Anyway, 7.8 kilometers. How long will this take a Kerbal to run? Let's find out. So, in the editor, I have now sped things up to four times speed. In the game, things are sped up to four times speed, making this 16 times real time. 16 times real time. And how long is it going to take us in real time now, watching this video, to get there? Oh, we're 3.2 kilometers, we're getting closer. It's going to take roughly two minutes. About two minutes. So two minutes sped up to 16 times speed. That's 32 minutes of walking in this hot, cramped, really uncomfortable uh, space suit. Although they can't be that uncomfortable. Thinking about it now, they actually can't be that uncomfortable. Why? Because they wear them 24-7. Never take them off. Never. Although I think inside, actually that's a lie, inside the home bases, inside the hitchhiker storage containers, they do take them off, don't they? Yeah, see? See? I don't know my stuff. I don't know my facts. I'm impersonating the hot gamer who's been playing this game for three years. Man. I've run out of things to say. I've run out of things to say. <laughs> now at this point, in this point in commentary, on any other video, I'd go, and we're still walking, and kind of start rambling, but I'm not in the mood to do that today. I want to be more professional, more... Ah, oh, screw it. And we're still walking, we're still walking across the plains, we're walking down towards the water now. Is he gonna trip? No, no he's not. No, that didn't happen, because past Harvey actually recording this footage right now knows it didn't happen. No, future Harvey does, future Harvey right now, me who is still past Harvey for you watching this video, technically. Mmm, subspaces, interlinks of time. Uh, we didn't trip. So I'm getting down closer, 400 meters away now, still on four times acceleration. Still can't see them, which is kind of worrying, but as we come over this lip, there they are. There they are, and we shall carry on walking down, and I shall carry on rambling about, and we shall carry on walking down. And as we get closer, we can see, make out the details, have a look at the damage. You can see docking port up on the top right there, did disappear, gone broken. It's done broke, mate, it's done broke. Uh, these tyres are fine, but everything is a bit interlinked, so I'm going to repair all them. Repair man Jeb is, not me, repair man Jeb. It's going to go around, inspect the damage, repairing wheels, left, right and centre. Uh, not centre though, because there are no wheels in centre, it's just back left, back right, front left and front right. Repairing everything there. And we set the target as that little docking port on the ground. How how did that happen? There are four. It was a one in five chance of it happening. And you'd expect that the biggest the biggest objects would be the most easily selected, seeing as they're bigger probes physically. If nothing else. But no, we managed to select the, the little docking port that was sitting on the edge. It's not even a ship. You'd think that the priority would be to select the ships. No. The debris. The debris is apparently more important. Anyway, so, these things are all on top of each other. Enough complaining. 
we need to sort this out and get them off of each other. It, it's kind of weird how the... I mean, the wheels aren't turning, for one thing, and no one's really sure why. Turns out, you have to actually press brakes. You have to set the brakes on and then turn them off again to get the wheels to go. So, we're going to be doing that, and there we go. Managed to get them out. Back wheel on this one is broken again. So, swap back to Repairman Jeb, run over, and repair it. And you may be wondering at this point, what are we going to do with the rest of, the, of this episode? There's a few good minutes left yet. Well, my answer to that is not an awful lot. Compared to the density, the density at the start of this episode, which was... Okay, we're building stuff, now we're launching, and now we're into orbit, and now we're transferring, now we're on lathe, and now we're landing on lathe, and now we've landed on lathe. Now it's going to be, and now we're on lathe, and, and, and now, and we're on lathe, and we're still, still on lathe. Yeah, it's an interesting density, I'd say. Density of content. It's very, very not interesting topic, really. It's really not interesting at all, is it? No. Well, I can talk about what I'm doing now. What I'm doing right now, at this very moment in time, is sitting in front of my desk with a few tissues scattered around on my desk because I have got uh, a flu, the cold, which has been hell trying to revise my GCSE maths, I can tell you. It's horrible. I am sitting here... Oh, in the game? In the game, sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I thought you meant... I thought you, I thought I meant in the sitting in real life. No, commentating. No, 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 no. In the game. Gonna line them up. Gonna line them up in a train. We're gonna make a train. I like trains. I like trains. Dun, dun, dun. That's a song, isn't it? Yeah. Um, if this is the awesome cross-range capability and other such weird terminology that doesn't really fit the context of these home modules, because they can link together in all sorts of different patterns. We could make a line like we are doing now. We can put them two by two like we're going to do eventually. We could uh, play snake. We could put them in a kind of five shape. I don't know. We'll, uh, we'll just put them all forward in a line. And hopefully... We'll be able to drive this like a train and actually be able to uh, move things around. So, selecting this last one. No, nope, that's the wrong way. Break. There you go. Ooh, so close to the water, there's an imminent risk of just landing in it. And we are carrying on and we're not being distracted or interrupted by anything. And there's a few minutes left on the video, so that's plenty of time. Plenty of time for me to just carry on commentating like this. So we get everything lined up well enough, and uh, it's nearly time to end the episode. Very nearly. Not quite, just very, very nearly. So we get this final one, and just kind of bring it round, just kind of turn it, try and get it. Come, come on, Harvey, it's not hard. Just forwards, and then left, and then back, and then dock. Very simple. Now, of course, there's one problem left. There is one problem that we must tackle yet, and that will happen in the next episode. How is Jebediah Kerman going to get in one of these? Hmm. Is he going to walk back? Is he going to be able to jump? No, no, it's too high for him to jump. Huh, a conundrum. To find out what happens to Jebediah Kerman, watch the next episode of Space Tourism, coming at some point. I'll see you all next time.